Okay, so the concept of polarity across the covalent bond gives rise to H bonds. That's where we left off just a few moments ago. H bond stands for hydrogen bond. Okay, and hydrogen bonds are represented like this. These are two molecules of water. Water forms, forms polarity. So you can see our delta values, positive around the hydrogen, negative around the oxygen. Notice that I can sort of rotate the second molecule of water, align the negative from the oxygen and the positive from the hydrogen of the other molecule, and they will actually attract each other. And so those water molecules will actually affix. And it only really lasts a trillionth of a second. It happens really, really quick. But it is still an attractive force where this hydrogen and this oxygen form what we call a hydrogen bond. Most of the time we represent a hydrogen bond with those three little dots there to represent that it's a hydrogen bond in a chemical drawing. And these hydrogen bonds can form because when we create polar covalent bonds and the molecules polarize, or the bond is polarized, molecules with opposite poles can attract. Now, in this case here, or in the case that I've drawn up here where we have carbon that's bound up to oxygen, or, and then the oxygen bound up to the hydrogen, we get a negative on one side uh, in the, with the oxygen, a positive on the other part of the molecule from the hydrogen, and we create that attractive force. Again, this all goes back to the formation of hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen has a very low electronegativity. Things like oxygen and nitrogen have very high electronegativities. So whenever we have molecules where hydrogen is associated or bound covalently to oxygen or nitrogen, we have the potential to create a hydrogen bond. To create a hydrogen bond, we would need a second molecule or a second part of a larger molecule, like a protein, that has the same relationship, where we have a low electronegative molecule bonded covalently to a higher electronegative molecule, creating a polar covalent bond that now has the potential for a hydrogen bond. So when this happens, we can form a weak bond. And the term weak bond, take that juxtaposed to a covalent bond, which is a strong bond. Electrons are shared, and you've got to add a lot of energy to break a covalent bond. Whereas a weak bond like a hydrogen bond, a lot of them form and, uh, form and disform and reform spontaneously. In the case of water, you know, a lot of you have water on the floor, on the floor, <laughs> on the table in front of you. And that water is continually, the, the individual molecules of water are continually forming and reforming little hydrogen bonds between two individual molecules of water. Over and over and over and over again. About a trillionth of a second is how long that hydrogen bond would exist. And then this molecule would go and form another hydrogen bond with another molecule. Over and over and over again. So these hydrogen bonds, again, these can occur between two different molecules or within the same larger molecule. So between molecules or within a molecule, DNA, which is a single molecule, it's just a really, really big molecule, the two strands of DNA are going to be held together by hydrogen bonds. So maybe you know a little bit about DNA. Let me just sort of give you the brief kind of 300,000 foot view of DNA. DNA, you have a backbone that's made out of a sugar and out of phosphate. And then attached to that backbone, you have these things called nucleotides. And these nucleotides, they go by letters. And you all know those letters. They're things like adenine, which is A, and guanine, which is G, and thiamine, which is C, and 
T, C. Thiamine, which is T, and cytosine, which is C. Now, on the other strand, we actually are going to bond through a hydrogen bond to the complementary nucleotide, or the complementary base pair. Adenine always binds to thiamine, guanine always binds to cytosine, T to A, and C to G. Now, these two individual strands, under normal physiological circumstances, body temperature and correct pH, are going to stay affixed together. They are actually going to be held together, attracted together. And they are attracted together by hydrogen bonds. Adenine and thymine form two hydrogen bonds. Guanine and cytosine form three hydrogen bonds. Thymine and adenine would form two, and then we would have three hydrogen bonds down there. Individually, a hydrogen bond is very, very weak. Take many, many hydrogen bonds together like this, and it becomes very, very strong. In fact, it is very difficult. If DNA was big enough that we could actually see it, I couldn't just grab onto the strands and just pull it apart. I couldn't overcome the hydrogen bonds. Yeah, so A and T, you got two hydrogen bonds that form. Between G's and C's, you have three hydrogen bonds. So let's see if you really understand this. What if I had a DNA strand that only had G's and C's? Would it be stronger or weaker than this molecule that I've drawn up on the board? Stronger. And why would it be stronger? Because you have more hydrogen bonds. In this case, we have a total of 10. In that case, you would have 12. So in DNA, the nucleotides use hydrogen bonds to hold the strands of DNA together. And again, you have two hydrogen bonds that form between the adenine and thymine. And we had three hydrogen bonds that form between the guanine and the cytosine. Now, proteins will also do this as well, and you all should be aware that proteins have what's known as a tertiary structure, which is basically a final three-dimensional structure the protein folds into. Is everybody familiar with that term, tertiary structure? You have primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. And the tertiary structure is basically what the protein folds up into for its final shape to have its final physiological function. That final shape, in a lot of cases, is held together. You have Interprotein hydrogen bonds that hold this part of the protein to this part of the protein. Okay, does that make sense? So we've hit on ionic bonds, covalent bonds, now hydrogen bonds. There is one type of force, chemical force, that I, one more type that I want to hit on. And those are known as van der, Waal, van der Waals forces or van der Waals interactions. Now this is a sort of a strange little quirky chemical thing, but it exists and it does have some influence on biological phenomena. So a van der Waals force, every once in a while, so remember, think back to our model of an atomic nucleus with the circulating electrons. Electrons are just kind of floating around in space around the nucleus, right? And every once in a while, you're going to have a collection of electrons all uh, in the same general area around that atomic nucleus. It's kind of like all of you in class right now. You're all collected behind me or, I guess, in front of me in the classroom right now. But if I were to move to the middle of the room, now some of you are on my right side, some of you are behind me, some of you are in front of me, and so there's this random distribution around me. Moving back out here, though, you're all organized into one area in front of me in the classroom. If you all were electrons and I was an atomic nucleus, I now have this huge negative spot, right, on one side of the, of the atomic nucleus. And when that happens, 
when we get this kind of brief little collection of electrons on one side of the atomic nucleus, we have what we would call a hot spot, a negative hot spot. And what will happen is when I have this chance separation of my negative and my positive around my atomic nucleus, any other atom that's nearby can spontaneously be caused to create the same orientation, where I have a collection of negatively charged molecules on one side because they all the negative in the second molecule gets pulled towards that positive side of the atom that formed just randomly. Okay, does this make sense? That's called the Van der Waals interaction. These now have an attractive force and they get pulled next to each other. This attraction happens very briefly. And it happens randomly. Now that random collection becomes very non-random in a heartbeat. The random collection of electrons on one side of an atom give it a slight negative orientation on one side, a slight positive orientation on the other, but it becomes non-random because when this random event occurs, it stimulates a second molecule to go through the same interaction. So another atom will have a electron distribution. In the oppositely charged regions of those two atoms that have briefly undergone a Van der Waals interaction are going to come in close contact with each other. They're going to form this brief fleeting bond that forms. And it's not really a true bond. Um, it's just basically just an attractive force. Um, so a couple places that this occurs. Uh, just in general in biology, you've ever seen a like, fence lizard crawling up a window? Maybe you look out your window and there's a lizard running up the, up the side of the window. The lizard's fit pad actually is a fluctuating dipole that causes the window, the molecules, the atoms of the window, to undergo that brief switch to orient so that you can have enough of a force that the foot pad will actually attract to the window and give enough strength that that lizard can climb right up. In DNA, again, we had the base pairs, A's and T's and G's and C's, but you all know that there's a double helix. And the DNA, it has a very specific, the, the, the basically the spiral, if you will, has some very specific characteristics. And the hydrogen bonds that occur are across the two strands of DNA. But to keep it in that double helix, we actually have Van der Waals interactions that occur between the base pairs in this direction. And so now the base pairs are held at precisely 0.34 nanometers apart and allows the exact angle of ascent and rotation on that DNA molecule to exist so that we have exactly what we need for DNA structure. So kind of the last thing here with Van der Waals interactions, again, these are weak bonds. So on their own, they don't have a whole lot of force. But when we have a large number of atoms, that undergo this electron redistribution, this will form a kind of bond, and it will be a very strong force, enough to carry, you know, a 25 gram or a 50 gram lizard to be able to run up a vertical surface such as a window. Right, as soon as everybody has this, we're going to really shift gears. So we're going to move away from some of the real heavy chemistry kinds of things, and we're going to start talking a little bit more about where chemistry comes to life.
So in the living organism, it's no surprise that there's a ton of chemistry going on. And that chemistry that's occurring, all of those reactions for metabolism and protein building and ATP production, they all are happening. All those chemical reactions are happening in a watery environment. Because living organisms are basically bags of water, or we could call them water mixtures. So you and I have a lot of water. We have water out in the extracellular fluid or the tissue fluid, and you have a lot of water inside of your cells. So all of our chemical reactions need to be able to occur in this watery environment. Now, the watery environment is actually going to be really important. And the reason it is, and you've heard this before, life cannot exist without water. And so there's recently been evidence that shows that Mars may have at one time had liquid water, and everybody gets really excited because maybe Mars has living organisms on it. It's because water is an absolute requirement absolute requirement for life. And the reason that is is because water has some very important and very unique characteristics. And we're going to go through a whole list of these characteristics and try to highlight why these become so important for a living organism. Okay, so first we got to comment on the shape of water. Anyone know what the overall shape is? Yeah, it's got a V shape. So water is shaped like a V. And as we know that V, if I kind of draw that out, there's an angle there. Vs have an angle. Water molecules have an angle as well. And the angle is going to be between the hydrogens or is going to hold the hydrogens apart fixed on the oxygen, and it is exactly or precisely 104.5 degrees. So it's a 104.5 degree angle. If it was any more or any less, it would drastically change the remaining characteristics, water characteristics that we're going to talk about. So this 104.5, if it was not 104.5 exactly, we would not have the same capacity for life. What if it was 104.4 degrees, Dr. Bowen? You guys wouldn't be sitting here. So very, very important that it's 104.5 degrees. Okay, water is made up of oxygen and hydrogen, and whenever we have oxygen and hydrogen in a covalent bond, we get a polar covalent bond. So waters, the water molecules are going to generate polar covalent bonds. Now, when water interacts with water through its polar covalent bond, so in other words, if I take two molecules of water, they are going to interact. How are they going to interact? Question? Not rhetorical. How, how are the water molecules going to interact? What kind of force? Bonds. Hydrogen bonds. So water is going to interact with other water molecules by a hydrogen bond. So in a mixture of water, if we look at a bottle of pure water, and we could look at it under a microscope that has powerful enough that we could see individual molecules of water. What we would find is the water is organized in such a way that those hydrogen bonds basically are holding the water together and preventing a large amount of movement of, of, of those water molecules. Now, because water interacts with hydrogen bonds not only with itself but other things, it can be used as a solvent. And you have heard water referred to as the universal solvent. And water is the universal solvent, not because it dissolves everything, but because it dissolves a lot of things. A lot of things. So 
So water as a solvent, what you'll see is the reason that it can dissolve things is it will take individual molecules of whatever it is. Maybe this is a molecule, I don't know, of testosterone, for lack of a better example. And we'll form these hydrogen bonds with each other and with the solute molecule. So individual molecules now begin to persist in the solution rather than big chunks of those molecules that don't dissolve very well. So we need to be able to break a molecule from its big cluster of itself down to individual molecules to be able to dissolve. And this happens because of the presence of hydrogen bonds, those characteristic hydrogen bonds. So water as a solvent dissolves lots of stuff. So lots of things dissolve in water. What do we call anything that plays really nicely with water that would dissolve well in water? What's the term we use? Okay, it would be soluble or it's not afraid of water, it loves water, so it's going to be hydrophilic. So anything that's hydrophilic, you put it into water and it's going to dissolve right away. Now, it's not everything. You know that if you pour cooking oil into a container of water, you form two distinct layers. You form the oil layer and you form the water layer. And that's because some things don't readily dissolve. And those things that don't readily dissolve, hydro, hydrophobic. So hydrophilic and hydrophobic. As we progress this semester, we're going to begin to talk about the cell. And we're going to begin to see that parts of the cell are hydrophilic and some parts of the cell are hydrophobic. And it's in fact this hydrophilic, hydrophobic nature of certain molecules that allow things like lipid bilayers to surround the cell, wrap around the cell, and actually create the cell itself and partition up extracellular fluid from intracellular fluid. Now, we can say that water is very chemically reactive. We can also say that water allows a lot of different chemical reactions to occur. very readily. And the reason that is is because in water the molecules can move around. And as those water or as those molecules move around in water, they have a higher frequency of bumping into each other. And as you increase the frequency that two individual atoms are going to bump into each other, you're going to increase the frequency that you're going to bump into each other just right to create a chemical reaction or to cause a chemical reaction to go. So by putting everything in water, we're actually increasing the ability for that to happen. Because we can dissolve things into water, it becomes much easier for those substances to be transported. So chemical reactions are going to occur readily. Solutes are going to be transported more readily. And both of these are due to the hydrogen bonds that can be formed both with water itself and also with other substances. Now, just to kind of give you a little bit more here on what's going on, you can see that I have a bunch of water molecules, and you can kind of, if you can pull this out kind of 3D in your mind, I would begin to form this sphere around each of these particles, where I have hydrogen bonds forming between individual water molecules and forming with that particle that we just dissolved. Okay? Those are called hydration spheres. And we need to be able to create these hydration spheres in order for solutes to be dissolved in the solvent of water. And really what's going on is wherever we have a negative part of the molecule a positive part of the water is going to be attracted to that hydrogen bond. Wherever we have a positive part of the particle, the oxygen negative part of the uh, water molecule, the oxygen is going to be attracted. 
Okay? And we'll form this sort of sphere around these particles. And as that sphere forms, it prevents that solute from interacting with another particle to reform into that kind of chunk of per, uh, uh, particulate matter. So water is a very important solvent because it allows chemicals to react more proficiently. It allows substances to be transported. Two things that need to happen inside of a living system for that living system to be highly effective. Water also exhibits a property known as cohesion. Now, cohesion basically is this characteristic that water has in other molecules where like molecules stay together. So what I mean by that is water molecules are actually going to conduct hydrogen bonds in such a way that water is going to remain cohesive or attached to each other. You can observe this next time we have a break and go out to the drinking fountain. You push the button and you get this nice stream of water. The water molecules are being held together so they don't spray out everywhere. If you find a chemical that is much more um, or has a much lower cohesion characteristic. If it was in a drinking fountain and you were to spray it, it would just spray everywhere. In human physiology, cohesion becomes really, really important because I have to move blood from my little toe all the way back up to my heart. And if I didn't have this cohesion uh, uh, characteristic where I basically could pull on one water molecule and a bunch of other water molecules would come with it, I would have a heck of a hard time moving water from my little pool back up to my heart against the effects of gravity. But because I have that characteristic where I can induce a little bit of pressure, I'm able to move water back up towards my heart within the bloodstream. Or the trees outside, they can move water from their root systems all the way back up into their leaves against the effects of gravity, all because of cohesion. And really what it is is you have little hydrogen bonds that form, and so if I pull on one water molecule, the hydrogen bond holds onto the next one, all in this long chain where I can pull all of these molecules of water all at one time. In addition to cohesion, like in a drinking fountain or pulling the water from your foot back up to your heart, cohesion also creates this thing called surface tension. So water cohesion creates surface tension. And there are a few places where surface tension is sort of important. And actually, really what it comes down to is having enough surface tension but not too much surface tension. Things like the lungs. We need a certain amount of surface tension in the lungs so that we don't have massive exchange of a variety of different um, gases but we have enough oxygen that permeates into the bloodstream and can enter into the bloodstream. Surface tension is important in other biological systems, uh, quite a bit more so um, outside of physiology. Things like surface tension of water, so the insect called a water strider can move across the surface of the water, or the black basculus lizard, which is called the Jesus lizard, that's the thing that <laughs> runs across the, on the surface of the, of the water. It's using that cohesion of water and surface tension to be able to achieve that. Water also exhibits another character that's similar to cohesion, but it's called adhesion. And rather than being like molecules, water has a tendency to stick to other molecules as well. And so water will actually cling to surfaces. In our body, this will help to form lubricants that stay inside of the joint. But also, as I'm moving water in the bloodstream from my toe back up towards my heart, not only is the water pulling on each other, but it's also clinging to the vessel wall. So it doesn't slip back down against uh, uh, within the effects of gravity back down towards my toes. 
You may also see things like this, an adhesion with uh, dew on grass. As the morning light fades into afternoon, we'll have dew that will hang off of blades of grass and other uh, other leafy uh, leaf leafy plants. So, in addition to being a solvent, having cohesion characteristics, adhesion, water is very chemically reactive. And what that means is chemically reactive uh, in the sense that it's going to interact with a variety of other molecules. We've already seen that putting salt in the water causes that water to ionize, and it's because of this chemically reactive characteristic of water. So water is going to ionize many molecules. Water ionizes many molecules. In fact, it also ionizes itself. So water self ionizes. Any water that's a pure mixture of water, or I'm sorry, that's pure water, we call it a mixture which is kind of weird, right, because it's just water. But in reality, what's happening is we're self-ionizing some of the water molecules. And water will form into three different types of molecules. It'll form what we classically think of as water, two hydrogens and an oxygen, H2O. Or we can self-ionize. And we can take two molecules of water, and we can pluck off a hydrogen, part, uh, a hydrogen from one of them and add it to another molecule of water or leave that hyd or, uh, steal the hydrogen from another molecule of water. And so not only do we have H2O, but we have H3O that can form that usually do we just simply call H+. Plus. This is our hydrogen ion. Or we can form OH-, minus, which is our hydroxyl. Most of the water that we would find would be H2O, but we are also going to have some protons in some of these negatively charged hydroxyl ions. This idea that water self ionizes, will anyone know where this really becomes important? Or, in other words, when is it really important with how much of this is in a solution? What's that? Yeah, and so what is that? That's pH. So this characteristic of water self-ionizing itself is the basis for pH. Now, if you haven't run into pH yet, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. This is something you already should have some concept of. If you don't have, if you haven't run into it before, you need to review it. Uh, if you're not really remembering exactly what it's all about and reviewing it's not going work very well, come and see me. And we'll deal more with pH and we'll give you some problems and things like that that you can work through. Okay, so chemically reactive. Water is also considered to be thermally stable. So what exactly does that mean? Well, it means that we can change the heat in a sample of water without changing the temperature. In other words, water holds heat. Now, I just used two terms, heat and temperature. Hopefully you're all aware that heat and temperature are two different characteristics. Temperature is the average molecular speed that we find inside of a substance. So if it's water, it's how fast the average speed of those molecule of water, uh, molecules of water moving throughout that mixture. Heat deals with the amount of temperature and how much of a solution or of a uh, how much volume we actually have. Okay. So heat is not temperature. Heat is based off of temperature and quantity. So 
Uh, let me give you kind of an example here because your, your faces are showing that maybe we have a little bit of a misunderstanding here. I'm going to give you a small cup. This water in here is 100 degrees centigrade. Okay? And we have one cup, one unit, uh, a, a measurement cup, eight ounces. Over here, I have my favorite body of water, Lake Superior. Lake Superior right now is probably about 34 degrees Fahrenheit or very close to one degree centigrade. So it's very close to freezing. And it's not a cup, but it's billions of gallons. Okay? Which of these two examples has a higher temperature? The cup, because it's 100 degrees versus 1 degree. Which one holds more heat? Lake Superior. Even though it's 34 degrees Fahrenheit or 1 degree centigrade, because there's so much more water here in quantity, it's not hot, but it holds a lot of heat. Because heat is this characteristic of temperature times quantity. And so since we have such a large quantity, we have large amounts of heat. Okay? So going back to water being thermally stable. When we add heat, we actually are going to affect increases in temperature. So if I take a pot of water and I put it on the stove, stove and I turn on the burner, I'm beginning to add heat. And that heat gets incorporated into the water and eventually the water begins to boil. Why is it boiling? Because I have lots of fast moving water molecules because I've increased the average temperature of the water. Well, water is thermally stable, going back here to A, you already have part of this in your notes, because water can hold large amounts of heat with little changes in temperature. The unit of measure for heat is a joule or a kilocalorie. I could add millions and millions of joules of heat to Lake Superior and not change its temperature or change its temperature by a tenth of a degree centigrade. And that's because it's thermally stable. Now, what is the chemical reason for this, that I can put a lot of heat in but not cause a lot of change? And the reason comes back to hydrogen bonds. So when we add heat, whether it's from a burner or throwing it in the microwave, when we add heat to water, the heat that initially gets put into that water has to go to break the hydrogen bonds. So there is heat energy that's inputted into a water solution, and at first it's going to go to break, water, the, break the hydrogen bonds between individual molecules of water. So heat is required to initially break the hydrogen bonds. Now what does that mean and what does that not mean? Well what it means is we're using a lot of that heat that's being put in to break hydrogen bonds. What it doesn't mean is we're not using that heat to increase the average molecular speed of a molecule of water. We're using it to break the bond. So we have to put a whole bunch of heat in and we have to break all of these bonds and then the additional heat that gets put in is going to begin to cause molecules of water to begin to move around faster and faster. So we can add heat after we've broken the hydrogen bonds. See now, it's really what it comes down to, if Andrew Neal here and I were to shake hands, Bryce Stiller would have to break our hands before I could go over towards Lewis, right? So we would have to add heat to break that bond, but I'm not I'm still not going to go anywhere until we add additional heat and then I, then I can move. So same thing's happening with water. So all of these characteristics become really, really important. I should have brought that figure up a while ago. Sorry. 
All of these characteristics, whether it's adhesion, cohesion, thermal stability, being the universal solvent, become very, very important in the context of you like that. <laughs> become very important in the context of water inside of living systems. Why, why is that four? Yeah, this is we're, we're like totally shifting gears. Number three was a long time ago, like pages ago. Number three was molecules to compounds. So we're still under so we talked a little bit about the mixture of water, but there's actually going to be other types of mixtures that are important in physiology. And you have an example here of a couple different types of mixtures that can exist. The term solution or solutions is reserved for mixtures where the solute, what's being dissolved, is very, very small, on the order of 10 to the minus 7 centimeters in diameter. So when we talk about a solution, such as a solution of glucose or a solution of salt, the solutes in that solution are very small. But we can actually increase the size of what's being incorporated into a mixture, and it changes what we call the mixture. So you can see right here in the figure next to our true solution, we have a mixture that's called a colloid. And there are a variety of different types of colloid, even some that show up in human physiology. By the way, most of these solutions or things like intercellular fluid, extracellular fluid, are primarily going to be solutions. With colloids, we increase the size of the particle, and so we have a larger solute that gets incorporated into the solvent. And when this happens, it's no longer a true solution. We actually begin to see a slight difference in the physical appearance of, of the solution. And the colloid solution with larger solutes, one of the most common colloids that you're going to run into is the proteins that we find in blood plasma. Blood plasma is a watery solution, and it's going to contain proteins, and they don't fully dissolve. They actually make the solution look a little bit hazy, and it's going to be a colloid. Next up from the colloid is the suspension. So these are the largest particles. So whenever we have really large particles in a solution, it's called a suspension. An example here is the red blood cells within the plasma. Red blood cells are pretty good size compared to an individual molecule of sodium. And so Red blood cells in the blood would be considered a suspension. Now, what can we do with suspensions? Well, we actually can cause the components of the suspension to fall out of solution. So if I take a full uh, I, uh, blood sample, maybe I take a little um, sample 5 mils out of my antecubital vein, and I just set that tube on the table, I come back 24 hours later, I'm going to see that there are three different, three different uh, um, layers inside of that centrifuge tube. The very lowest is going to be all the red blood cells that have fallen out of suspension of the plasma. Now there's one last type of mixture, and I don't have a picture here, uh, but you're going to be very familiar with this, and that's called an emulsion. And an emulsion is a mixture of two solutions that don't go together easily. So two solutions that don't mix easily. So I can take oil and I can take water and I can put them together and I can blend them up. And I can get them to sort of mix together pretty well. 
uh, and maybe it's enough time that I can actually put it on myself, and I can have a nice balsamic vinegar. Uh, and then you come back a day later and you look at that container, and you've got two sets of flavors. Shake that bad boy up again, and it mixes up, and you pour it on your salad, and is it emulsion? It's emulsion. Yeah, that's definitely not spelled right. <laughs> we might as well erase that. <laughs> um, emulsion. I'd like to see you get up here. <laughs> All right, another kind of shifting gears here to talk about a, another concept that we would find in the chemistry of the biological system, and that relates to concentration. And how do we actually measure and quantify, quantify concentration? And there are a variety of different ways that we can measure and quantify concentration. And we're going to talk about a few of the most important that are for uh, biological systems. Um, concentration is going to be abbreviated with two brackets frequently. And so like, if I wanted to know the concentration of hydrogen, I could put my hydrogen inside those brackets. And I would read that, the concentration of hydrogen ion. Everybody have this on as well. Make an adjustment here. So concentrations become very important because as we change concentration, we can actually increase and decrease things like rate of reaction. Or we can increase or decrease the rate of charge particle movement across a membrane, which we would call current. So we have to be able to quantify this. And we're going to run into uh, quantities, measurements of, of concentration. And it would be nice if we understand them. Now, when we look at a variety of different molecules that we would uh, see inside of a physiological system, we're going to have to use different types of concentration measurements. So for electrolytes, we're going to use a, a, a certain measurement to measure the concentration of electrolytes. Now, what you're going to remember about electrolytes is electrolytes are charged particles. They're going to either have a negative charge or a positive charge. The picture you can see here, these are a, a bunch of different electrolytes that are important in human physiology. Among the most important are going to be the top three, sodium, potassium, and calcium. Now, electrolytes electrolytes are going to have both the charge and a measure of concentration. And we have to account for both of these. We have to account for both the charge and the concentration. Well, why do we have to do that? Why do we have to account for both? Well, as you're going to be able to see here, consider a single gram of sodium. Sodium just has one charge. It is going to have a smaller effect or a less of effect compared to a charged one gram of calcium, which has a plus two. So the effects that I get from one gram of sodium in charge is less than the effects that I get from the charge of calcium with its two positive charges. If I were to dissolve both of these in the same amount of water, and I were to pass electrical current through them, I could conduct electrical current through the calcium-containing solution far more effectively, just because there is more charge per unit of calcium. So when we're dealing with the concentration of electrolytes, we have to account for
for both our uh, concentration of the molecule and the charge of the molecule. And so when we do this, we use a, uh, a form of concentration known as the equivalent.